Hey, if you've got a collection of ancient documents in front of you, can you turn with me this morning? I want to go back to the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, and I want to go to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 6. If you can turn there for me, that would be great. I want to share something um, basically along the lines of something I shared a few weeks ago. I, I, I spoke at the Combined Churches meeting a few weeks back. And um, after that, I think I mentioned that I, I, I was in a prayer meeting the week before and God laid something on my heart and I wondered whether it was for the prayer meeting. And I felt like God said, no, it wasn't. And then I was pre speaking at the Combined Churches um, later on in the week on the Sunday night and I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, that's what that's for. I want you to take that and I want you to share this. I did that and I had some pastors and different people come up to me afterwards and, and, and let me just preface by saying in terms of spiritual giftings, uh, Ephesians, I, I am not a prophet. I don't claim to be a prophet. I'm not standing here going, I'm a prophet. Um, I believe according to 1 Corinthians 12, we can all move in the gift of prophecy, but the gift of prophecy, the spiritual gift of prophecy is different to the office of a prophet, Ephesians 5. So I don't want to get into that, but just to let you know, I'm not standing here saying I'm a prophet. But I believe that what God laid on my heart that day was, was, was somewhat prophetic. And I had some pastors and leaders come up to me afterwards and go, we believe that's a prophetic word, not just for tonight, but that's something for the broader region. And so what I want to do today is I want to share something along those uh, similar lines with you. So if you were at the Combined Church meeting, you've probably heard some of this, but I want you to open your heart and ask the Lord, what does he want to say to you today? Because you're here again today, and um, I believe this is what God sort of put on my mind to share. Um, how many of you felt like when you heard the restrictions that kind of the wind was taken out of your sails a little bit? I know when I heard that, oh no, we're going back into... A lockdown. Um, we, we've, had a tr we, we've had a very up and down 18 months, haven't we? Everybody's had an up and down 18 months. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of all had this illusion or this sense that, oh, we've come through it now and we're kind of sailing on now. We'll, now coronavirus will become something that the kids learn about in history class at school, of when, you know, but we're kind of getting through. And then here we are today, we find ourselves going back into uh, things that probably take our mind back to the past. The, there was a period there where we couldn't gather at all, about 8, 12 weeks or something, couldn't gather. Um, we couldn't have more than X amount of people in your house. You couldn't go anywhere. You felt like your freedoms and liberties were taken away. And when I heard that yesterday, I, I thought, oh gosh, I wonder how many people feel like there's been a little bit of uh, wind that's been taken back out of their sails. Um, but I want to encourage you today that it doesn't matter what happens in the natural world. It doesn't matter whether we're up or down, left or right, whether we're winning or we feel like we're losing. Uh, the God that we serve has always been the same. The, <coughs> the God we believe in has always been the same. I gave my life to Jesus on a roundabout in the middle of the Pacific Highway at 19 years of age. Trucks and buses going around and, and I prayed a prayer where I just said, I, I think that there's something out there and I think that the Jesus story is, is, is the true story. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you out there is, is, is I've got a couple of situations in my life. I, 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 I need you to change some things so I can run after you because I know that I won't if you don't. And, you know, some people would say that was a bit of a wishy-washy way to do it, but I think God looks at our heart and he knows when we're being real and he knows when we're being fake. And we're, we need to be honest and real with God. He knows it anyway, so don't, don't tell little fibs. You can't get around it. God knows. So I was honest with God, and God met me in my place of honesty. He met me, and here I am all these years later, um, you know, having made the decision in my life that I'm going to follow Jesus, whether the rest of the world does or not, whether society says it's cool anymore, acceptable, and it's not anymore. But I've still made my choice that I'm going to stand on who Jesus is, who God is, and the truth of God's word, and uh, that's going to lead my life down a path, and it's going to lead your life down a path. But I made my decision to follow after him. But the God I chose to follow back then hasn't evolved and changed. I have, but he hasn't. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same to ever, forever. And I know we live in a time where even in the church, as we speak, there are whole movements and whole groups of believers that uh, have kind of moved on and their mentality is that as society has progressed, God has progressed too. As society has changed, well, God has changed too. Well, if God is the same yesterday, today and forever, there seems to be something fairly steady and firm and solid about God. 
where he's not influenced by culture, he's not influenced by societal change, he's not influenced by what people want or don't want anymore, not influenced by what's cool, not influenced by how many Twitter followers that the popular opinion makers have or don't have. He's not uh, uh, influenced by who has the most friends on Facebook. He's not looking down saying who's the most popular celebrity and what are their opinions, I'll align myself with that. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And even if nobody was to walk after God anymore, God would still be God and he would still be the same. He doesn't change. He's very stable and very secure in who he is. He's not looking for our affection to make him feel good. Okay? He doesn't need us to follow him to validate his position on a throne somewhere in this place we call heaven. God is very, very secure and very comfortable in his own skin, if I can use that sort of a term. He's not trying to be somebody else, wanting to be somebody else. God is God. God is God. <laughs> and, and, and in Judges chapter 6, we've got an interesting um, situation taking place. The nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And if you read the book of Judges, and I've talked about this before, it's like a washing machine. It's a cycle. The clothes go up, the clothes come down, they go up, they go down. Israel love God with all their heart. And maybe some of you in this room, you can relate to this. Love God with all their heart, following after him, believing him, walking in his ways, and God's blessing is upon their life. Then they get introduced to either foreign, in, in many cases it was foreign wives that worshipped different gods, so they decided to worship different gods, and when they turned away from the one true God and worshipped foreign gods, God withdrew his hand from them, and he gave them over to whatever it is that they wanted to chase after. So all of a sudden the protection of God was lifted, and a nation would come on in and invade Israel and take them over. They went from being sons and daughters of the Most High to literally being slaves of another nation. After they had had enough of being slaves, they would remember, why are we doing this? There is a God in heaven that cares for us. They would cry out to God. God would come to them in his compassion and grace, and he would raise up a deliverer, and that deliverer would fight the nation that had come that was oppressing them, and Israel would win, and they would be free again, and they would worship God. But then after a while of, of, of living in this place of victory and provision and covering of God's protection, they turned away from the one true God, and they began worshiping other gods again. So what happened? God withdrew his hand when they started worshipping other gods. A nation came and invaded them. They weren't strong enough to win without God, so they got defeated. They were now becoming oppressed by another nation. When they were sick of that, what did they do? They cried out to God, Oh God, help us. God in his great compassion would come back to them again and he would pull them out of the pit they put themselves in and all of a sudden they'd be on top of the world praising God. Then what do you think they would do? They would go and chase after other gods again. So the book of Judges is like a cycle. It goes through this cycle and he raises up this judge and then that and this and that. Here we are in this situation where Israel are in the bottom of the pit. They're being invaded by other armies. They're not the head. They, they really are the tail. They're not living in victory. They're being oppressed. They're afraid and fearful and they're hiding out, being raided by these other nations. And enter the story, this guy by the name of Gideon. Who's ever heard of Gideon? Gideon is a, is a great, great read. He's a, he's, a, he's a great man of God. And you can learn so much. Young people, study the life of Gideon. You'll learn so much about, about, about God and so much about your potential and so much about what God can do through somebody whose heart is fully committed to him if you read uh, the life of, of Gideon. But what I want us to look at here is in Gideon chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. And here's what happens. An angel appears. So Gideon, it says that Gideon is in a, a, a wine press, which is a hole in the ground threshing wheat. Now, normally they would thresh wheat out in the open on top of a mound and you throw the wheat in the air and the wind would blow and the chaff would blow away and the good wheat would fall to the ground. And this process would go on where the wind would blow the chaff and they would keep the good wheat. Now, Gideon is fearing for his life and the nation are in this place of, of panic. And so Gideon's actually in a wine press, which is a hole in the ground threshing wheat. Why? It says because he was afraid. He's afraid of these, if I'm threshing my wheat in public, these raiding armies will come, they'll take it all. So I'm in a hole in the ground threshing wheat. And an angel appears to Gideon. An angel appears to Gideon. And here's, here's how the encounter takes place in, in uh, Judges 6, verse 12 and 13. It says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I'll guarantee Gideon didn't feel like a mighty warrior. That's why he's threshing wheat in a hole in the ground. But the angel calls him a mighty warrior. Isn't it interesting? I think God has a different opinion of me and you than we probably have of ourselves. I think God sees so much more in us than we actually see in ourselves. God probably sees so much more in, in, in us than others see in us. God, if, if, we, if, we would just, if we would just fully learn to surrender to God, 
If we could learn to fully hand ourselves over to his plans, his purposes, and his mission, boy, would our life make a difference. Boy, I wonder where we would land. I wonder if we would look back on our life at one point and go, man, I would have never dreamed Spielberg couldn't have made a movie of this, of me going from where I am to here, simply because I flicked the switch and I made the decision. I put my roots down in God and said, I'm not going to be swayed. I'm not going to be pulled left or right. I'm going hard after Jesus. So this angel appears and the angel says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Watch Gideon. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why is all this happened to us? And where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about? Picture this, you're in a hole in the ground, you're threshing wheat. Now this happened, and an angel appears to you. An angel. And by an angel, I'm not saying I'm out in the backyard working and my wife appeared to me, although she is an angel. But I'm not talking about that kind of an angel. I'm talking about a literal angel, big dude, wings, muscle, sword, all the stuff that goes with an angel. An actual angel appeared. Imagine that. You go home today, you're doing the washing. You're hanging out the clothes and an angel appears next to you. You're doing a business deal or playing sport and an angel physically, poof, just bang, there he is. This big sucker stands there. What are you, what's going on in your mind? More to the point, what are you going to ask him? What's going to be the first thing out of your mouth if an angel appears before you? I, I can tell you a few things that I might ask him. Number one, can you tell me why the West Tigers cannot get their act together and win a game? God, it's right, you know what, because it's right there. It's a question that's right there. There's questions that are sitting right at the surface of our life. And if we could have a moment with God, what would be the first thing that would pop out? What would be the first thing that you would say? What would come out? Why did I end up with chicken legs? Why have I not got those, you know, those big muscly legs you see on other people? I've got chicken legs. God, why did you give me chicken legs? Why actually did the chicken cross the road in the first place? Anyone ever wonder that? Why did the chicken cross the road? There's a great sign we came across recently, and, and it, it said this. It said, uh, I dream of a world where chickens can cross the road without having their motives questioned. What a great sign. But why did the chicken actually cross the road? We don't know. We don't have answers to these questions. What is it that would be sitting right there in your life right now? That if an angel appeared to you, you would ask this question. You would say this. Gideon goes straight to the point. He says, if God is with us, then where are all the miracles? If God is with us, and then where are all the miracles? Why would that be the first question right there? An angel appears, and the first thing that Gideon has to say is, where are all the miracles of our fathers? Where are all the miracles? Why was that the first question right there when he had a chance to basically talk to God? Well, he goes on and he explains why the question was right there. And here's what I want us to think about today. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders? Now watch this bit, don't miss it, that our fathers told us about. What is the message that you and I are communicating to the next generation about who God is? What are they getting out of us? What are they learning to expect from the God that we drag them to a building on a Sunday? to sing songs about and worship. By drag them to, you know what I mean. What's the message that they're getting from us? What's the message that my workmates are getting about who God is from me? What's the message that the guys I play sport with are getting out of who God is from me? You see, Gideon says right here that the generation before us, our fathers told us about God. But they didn't tell us just information about God. Facts and figures. They told us about a God that does miracles. They told us about a God that can change things. They spoke about a God who delivers. They spoke of a God who answers prayer. They spoke of a God who opens blind eyes. They spoke of a God who cleanses lepers. They spoke of a God that turns water into wine. They spoke of a God who feeds multitudes with very little. 
They spoke of a God who raises the dead. They spoke of a God who calms storms. They spoke of a God who walks on water. They spoke of a God of encounter. They spoke of a God of encounter. They spoke of a God that you don't just need to give intellectual assent to. They spoke of a God that just didn't come down and give us a book of information and go, that's all you need to know, folks. There's the book. They spoke of a God who came down and did something for them. And he's referring to when they came out of Egypt and the miracles that God did and the tangibleness of God. Can you imagine being those guys in Israel and Moses didn't just come along and say, you know what, God sent me, God loves you, isn't God awesome? And God's going to set you free. God then did some things. There were some encounters, experiences, there was some tangibleness and reality to that because if God is real, then God is real. Amen? If God is real then he's real. He's not real in my mind and real in a book and real in theory and real in, 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 in orthodox understanding, but in the practical, down-to-earth, everyday bits and pieces of life, he's completely absent and has nothing to do with it. That's not God. That's not the God that we hear Jesus talk about. It's not the God that Gideon was grown up hearing about. Gideon heard about a God that did miracles, wonders, great things, a God that interacted with people to the point that when that God was absent and nothing was happening, he didn't settle for it. That question was right there and he said, where is that God? Because that's who God is. God's not this. God's not me threshing wheat in a hole in the ground. God's not us being completely plundered and, and, and God's not us being totally devoid of any sense of his presence or any sense of encounter, never hearing his voice, never feeling his affection, never... God. That's not God. God is a God of encounter. And the question was right there because the generations before him spoke to him and spoke to his friends and his generation about a God of encounter, a God who actually did things, a God you can get to know. A God who, when you pray, listens and can actually answer a prayer. You know, when, when I got saved, uh, the first ever prayer that, that, I, that I prayed on that roundabout, <coughs> I had two tangible, practical, real-life situations. One, I was dating a girl, and she was an absolute honey, looked like Meg Ryan, and I was honest to God. I said, if I'm following you, I know you go this way. God, me and her, we're, we're going this way. So God, I, 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 I believe you're there and I, I want to follow you, but I'm definitely going to follow her. So you've got to do something there. And you know what he did? He did. He, he did something that, that broke that apart and set me on a course. I was also living in a certain environment that was not good for me, but I was honest with God. God, here's the deal. I know that I'm going to pray this prayer to you, go home tonight, get dressed up with me, mates, and we're going to hit the town and we're going to do what we always do. I know we will, and I'm just being honest with you, God, so you're going to have to change that. In seven days, and I don't want to get into it again, some of you have heard the story. I had a miracle in seven days, and that was broken up. God tangibly came and did tangible things in my world to change my life. And that's the God that we serve. That's the God that we serve. What's the message that we're passing on to the next generation of believers? Are we lowering the expectations so low that by the time they take over churches, it'll just simply be a lesson in moral values of a Sunday morning? with no expectation that, 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 that God's interested, no expectation that God can change things, no expectation that, that if God doesn't want to change the thing, God will change you in the middle of the thing. What are we passing on to the next generation in terms of God? What is that message? And by next generation, I'm not just talking to the older people. I'm talking to you younger, younger people as well. The next generation might be the next generation of people that follow Jesus. They could be your friends at school that aren't walking with the Lord yet, but they're going to. So what message, what are you communicating to them about the value of God and who God is? What's the message that we're passing on? Is it a message of a God of regulations and rules? Is that what we're giving the next generation? God's all about rules and regulations. Is that the God that we're talking about? Is that the message we're giving? Is, is it a message of a God of do's and don'ts? You've you got to do this. You have to do that. You have to do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Is it just a, a God of do's and don'ts? Is it a message of a God who wants to make us all nice people? It's got to be nice people. Because anyway, we're Christians, we've got to be nice. And that's what God does. You come into your world and he'll just make you really, really nice. Is that the message we're giving them? You're a naughty kid. Come to Jesus because he'll make you nice. You're a bad person. Come to Jesus because he'll make you good. 
Is that what it is? Just a message of a God who just wants to make us all nice people? Or is it a message of a God of encounter? Psalm 66, 16 says this. It says, Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I'll tell you what he did for me. I'll tell you what he did for me. I'll tell you what he did for me. Not I'll tell you what I understand about. Not I'll tell you a Bible verse. Not I'll give you a theology lesson. He said, come to me. I'm going to tell you what he did for me. In other words, God has done some things for me. Hands up if God's done some things for you in your life. God's done some stuff in your world. And here's the thing. And if you, you, if, if you don't think he has, I'm going to tell you this. I know from experience he has. Just sometimes we don't recognize it. Sometimes we don't recognize it. But God has done stuff because that's what he does. He does things. He doesn't just throw a rule book down. He doesn't just, he, he does things. He gets involved in our world in, in little ways, in big ways. Sometimes we sit back. Um, I was talking to a guy recently and um, he was having a, a situation in his, in his marriage where it just wasn't going good and it was about to fall apart. And, 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 and through an absolute miracle, something happened that was an absolute miracle. You, can't, you couldn't mentally come up with a reason or excuse. It happened. And I remember sitting with him after that and him saying to me, Alan, I want God to do something in my life, something you know, that, that, that is undeniably him, just like he did with you when you were 19, you came to faith. And I looked him in the eye and said, mate, what about this? You're about to lose your family. You lose your wife, lose everything, and God did this. What about that? Couldn't see this miracle. I'm saying I'm praying for a miracle like you had in my life. Not that I want my marriage to fall apart and God to save it, but the point is it was so tangible and so supernatural. But he couldn't see it. He couldn't acknowledge that God had done it. See, when people, the world we live in, they don't want information about God. They want to know that God cares enough to get involved in their world. And God does. He gets involved in their world. Come and listen, all you who fear God, I'll tell you what he did for me. Not information about him, but I'll tell you what I've experienced with him. I'll tell you what God has done for me. Um, uh, John chapter 4, the woman at the well. What a great story. You know, this, this woman's at a well and Jesus, he, he, he rocks up at the well. He's been walking with his, with his, with his disciples and uh, the whole story there, he didn't have to go through Samaria. It says he had to go through Samaria. Good Jewish boys didn't go that way. They went another way, but he felt in God, obviously, that he had to be there. He rocks up at a well. The, the, all the disciples go, we've got no food. We need to go shopping. Jesus says, I don't shop. You guys go shopping. I'm waiting out here by the well. So he sends the boys shopping. The woman's there, and uh, he ministers to this woman. And then the woman gets up, and she runs into town. The disciples come back from town. What with? couple of grocery bags from Woolworths. That's what they come back with. That's it. They don't bring a single person back. They haven't talked to anyone about nothing. They come back with food. The woman runs in and what does she do? She goes in there and she says, come and see a guy who told me everything about my life. In other words, come and see a guy who just did something for me. He just spent time with me when none of you people would. He accepted me when none of you people did. He sat out there while I was drawing water. None of you people do because you know who I am. So you time it so that nobody's out there with me. Come and see that God. And the entire village, it says, came out and they sat there and they heard the words of Jesus. And then they eventually said, Jesus, we believe in you, not because of what she said anymore, but because we've now heard you ourselves and encountered you ourselves. All of that happened because a woman ran into town and was not ashamed to say, let me tell you what he did for me. Let me tell you what he did for me. Um, uh, there's that, everyone knows the story about that demoniac dude. He's you know, cut, ripping chains and cutting himself and banging and, and everything like that and they can't contain him and Jesus gets out of the boat. I think it's at Capernaum. And uh, the story goes that this demon-possessed guy runs up to him and the demons are trembling. What, have, you know, what are you here for? And Jesus sets this guy completely free. When he sets the, the guy free, the demons run into a herd of pigs. Anyone remember the story? And the pigs run down the hill and the pigs drown. And the herders who are watching this, they're seeing a demon-possessed guy right there and they see him get set free. But they also see the pigs run down the hill and they, they do a value assessment and go, your personal freedom is not worth as much as the local economy. So we're going to go and tell Jesus, you better get out of town because you cost us a few dollars. So 
The townspeople come out to Jesus, they see the man sitting there and they say, go. The, 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 this ex-demon-possessed guy, he tries to get in the boat to go with Jesus. Only time I can find uh, in, in the New Testament where Jesus actually says to someone, you can't come with me. Only person I know of. He goes to get in the boat. Jesus says, no, you can't come with me. I want you to go around the Decapolis, this region with 10 major cities. So I want you to go around Decapolis and I want you to tell everybody what I have done for you. What I have done for you. What I have done for you. Come and listen, all you who fear God, I'll tell you what he did for me. How many of you remember your first encounter with Jesus? How many of you remember your very first, that moment where the penny dropped, that moment of salvation, that moment where life was going this way and it was hopeless and, and, and maybe you, you didn't have any hope for the future, but something happened and your attention was arrested and you realised there is a God in heaven who actually loves me. Not a religious figure. Not, a, not, a, not, a, not a, a, a set of moral values or another, um, you know, sort of set of ethics to live by, but an actual God who actually cares for you, who actually loves you, who actually has a plan for your life and a purpose for your life. How many of you remember that moment, getting that I, I, I remember very clearly, I can still remember to this day, uh, uh, the moment that the, the penny dropped for me that I was actually a child of God. I was standing on a car, my body position was like this. My right hand was on the top of the car. I was looking across at somebody, having a conversation, and I just remember it hitting me. I'm a child of God. And I can't tell you the burst of emotion that took off inside of me while I'm just standing there by myself with my hand on the bonnet of a car. Something amazing took place, and I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew. In that moment, I'm a child of God. I just knew. I, I can't tell you uh, the, the feelings or describe it to you. I can tell you about it, but I just can't do justice to what it felt like in that moment, 19 years of age, when that reality hit me. I can't tell you what it was like when I prayed those couple of prayers and within seven days of me praying those prayers, God did two absolutely huge, tangible, evidential things for me uh, that got my attention so much on him that I had no choice but to say, God, if you want me that bad, you can have me. Make something out of this life. Do something with me. What was your encounter like with him when you first came to faith? What are some of the things that God has done in your world? How often do we talk of what God does for us as opposed to what we know about God? How much time do we spend talking about the good things that God has done? When we don't talk about the good things that God has done for us, we begin to lose the stories. We begin to lose the stories. This is what Gideon's saying. He's saying, where are all the miracles that our fathers told us about? Our fathers told us stories of a God that built faith in us. And now that's the God that we're believing for. That's the God we're expecting. That's the God we're reaching for. That's the God we're praying to. That's why, we're, that, that's why I'm not just sitting here in this pit going, well, God's abandoned us. There is no God. Uh, there's no hope for the future. It doesn't matter what happens. And when this angel appears, no, no, no. There's something just bubbling under the surface. It's a question. Okay, God, where are the miracles? Where are the miracles? Where are the miracles? Why? Because that's what was put into me. That's what was put into me. God is a God of encounter. God is a God of miracles. God is a God who does things. God is a God who invests, who comes down to us who meets us who listens who speaks and so Gideon had that expectation inside of him he's a God of encounter you got no idea whose faith you might stir up when you begin to speak about what God did for you you have no idea uh, years and years ago um, we had a, a, a miracle our, our, our um, second son Jonathan who was born over in India and um, at one point there he just had fluid all over his body his organs weren't forming and so on and the doctors in India uh, they made it very clear to us that you're going to have to abort your, your, your son he, he's just not forming and, and, and it's not happening and we went home cut a long story short one night and we sat on the end of our bed and we didn't pray these great giants of faith prayer we blubbered like babies and all we could really say was God do something you know it was one of those moments where where you know all the prayers we practice they anyone ever do that you, we practice these nice pristine prayers that are polished and sanitized it was a moment where none of those prayers worked and something just gushed out of our heart and all it was was tears and a simple cry God do something do something I don't even know what to pray. I don't know what to say. It gushed out. Well, well, you know what? Praise God, he did. He completely healed uh, our son. And uh, we had the scans and we saw it all. It wasn't just some theory. We know it was a fact. It happened a miracle. Some years later on, I mean, we're living in Bundaberg and I'm, uh, I'm working on a tomato farm out at Jinjin. And uh, uh, while I'm working on this tomato farm <laughs> at Jinjin, um, I, I, uh, I, um, I, many, I, I told the story to, to these ladies. I used to... Um, sort of get a, a, a share share ride thing. What do you call it? 
carpool, that's it. And you knew know, it had a better name than a share ride thing. So I used to carpool with these, these two girls. One of them was a good friend of ours and her partner was a friend of mine and Jackie's. And the other one was very anti-Jesus. She's probably one of the most anti-Jesus human beings I've personally ever met one-on-one. -on -one. She was very anti. She would shut it down any time God came up or religion. She was just hard. Anyway, I'm in the car one day and I'm sitting in the back seat and Michelle, this girl, she's driving, and uh, Marie, her cousin, is sitting next to her in the front. And Marie, for whatever reason, turns and goes, Alan, tell us that story again about what happened to Jonathan, your son. And so I thought, fantastic, captive audience, we're in a car, we've got 20 minutes till we're home, Michelle can't do nothing because her, her cousin asked me. So I just start sharing the story about Jonathan, right, and how God healed John. Thought nothing of it. Years pass, we bump into um, to Marie somewhere, and just in conversation that comes up, oh, Marie, how's Michelle doing? And we hear the story. Well, Michelle is actually now attending a church and she's following Jesus. So how did that happen? Because Michelle is not the person that I would have thought that would happen to. And they relayed this story. She said, well, Michelle and her, her, her uh, partner at the time, they got married and Michelle fell pregnant. And as they were going through the pregnancy, it turns out that, that there ended up being something wrong with the child. I, if I remember correctly, I think the child might have been born and there was something wrong with the child. And so Michelle turns to her husband and says, hey, why don't we take the baby to a, a, a church person, a pastor, and get them to pray for the baby and maybe something will happen. So they do. They take the baby to the pastor. The pastor prays for the child. The child is miraculously, supernaturally healed and they both bow their knee to Jesus and to this day they're now living for Christ. And when Michelle tells me that story, I'm listening, I'm listening, I'm listening and I'm in awe of it thinking this is amazing and the Holy Spirit just gently whispers on the inside, hey, Alan, where do you think she might have got the idea to get someone to pray for a child that wasn't doing well? And I thought all the way back those years to the story. This is what God has done for us. And it planted a seed in that woman's life. And how many stories have you and I got? And do we talk about the stories of what God does? Or do we just talk about theories and philosophies and ethics and do's and don'ts? Or are we talking about the story? See, the stories are the real tangible evidence of God's encounter and, and of God's movement in my life. God's movement in my life. Let me finish with this. Why can we be so sure that we can encounter God? Okay? Let me give you a reason why everybody sitting here should be 100% confident that you could have some kind of encounter with God as a part of your Christian experience. Here's why. Because when Jesus spoke to the disciples about the Holy Spirit who was to come, he didn't speak of information they needed to know, but he spoke of experiences they could expect to happen. Let me give you some examples. Matthew 10, 20. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. In other words, when you get taken before these kings and rulers and religious people and you've got to give an account for your faith, don't rehearse it. Don't go home and study out a message and take notes. You know what? In that moment, you're going to have an encounter with me. I'm going to give you words. I'm going to flood into your brain with things that, 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 that you can say that are going to baffle the smartest, most intelligent people. I'm going to give you the answer that you feel like you don't have the answer to. And that's why you stay. That's why we don't talk to people about Christ. We feel like we don't know enough. So we pull back. Yet he said here, put yourself in those positions because here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll get the Holy Spirit to communicate with your brain and I'll give you things and you'll start to speak things that you didn't have any storage facility for because I'm going to give it to you in that moment. Does that sound like a Holy Spirit or a God of information or a God of encounter? It's a God of encounter. John 14, 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So he's going to give you insight into God. This Holy Spirit is actually going to give you insight. That's why you can sit here in a message. Don't ever sit on a Sunday and just listen with your ears. Listen with your spirit. Listen with your spirit. We could, be, we could be throwing junk at you. I mean, there's, you can go to a Christian bookstore and one guy will tell you, pick a theological topic and he'll go right off to the right. Another guy's going to go right off to the left. We can both say the other guy's wrong. Listen to the Holy Spirit inside of you because he's in there and he's wanting to keep you on a course of true doctrine. The Holy Spirit wants to bring you to a place of maturity. So you don't just eat everything and listen to everything. He wants to actually teach you. You've got this, this resource inside of you that even as I'm speaking now, this Holy Spirit's doing things in you, either amening, thumbs up, or going, eh, don't, don't take that one on. Eat the meat, spit out the bones, whatever way you want to put it. But he brings back to your memory. He says he'll bring back to your memory. He'll, he'll remind you of things I've said to you, stuff that God has said to you in the past. 
stuff you've learnt, revelation you've got. It's amazing. You might feel like it's not there, but in the right moment, the Holy Spirit just brings this stuff up. It's a supernatural thing. It's just not a natural thing. He didn't just say, well, you didn't write that one down. It's gone. No, no, no. It's amazing how just at the right time, things pop back into our brain. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He said you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He didn't say you'll receive a whole bunch of information. I'm gonna, you're going to receive a rule book. You're gonna, you know, he said you're going to receive power. And we, a few weeks ago, we looked at that word power, didn't we? It, it, it literally means this. It means inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. So in other words, when the Holy Spirit comes to us, uh, and if you bow your knee to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, you get with him all his innate, inherent uh, power and personality. It's all there. It's all there. So you've got this power inside of you, this, this, this ability that's beyond yourself because it's the Holy Spirit, but it's resident inside of you. Jesus didn't say, when I go, I'll send the Spirit and you shall receive a whole bunch of information. So you can give the next generation a whole bunch of information. He said, no, I'm going to give you power. Power to transform, power to change, power to live the life that I've called you to live so that your testimony cannot be, hey, look at me, aren't I a great person? No, your testimony is, you know what? I'm not a great person, but because of the Holy Spirit, because of what God has done in my life, I am who I am by the grace of God, is how Paul the Apostle put it. I am who I am, not because I just, I, I read a tiny Robin's book and I've worked out the secrets to be great. Not because I, I self-controlled myself out of sin. Not because I was, no, no, I, I am who I am because of the grace, the power of God in my life has transformed me and has changed me. I didn't pick up a book and go, I'm going to live by a new set of standards. What does this book have to say? That's not why I'm different. I'm different because the power of God came into my life transformed me and changed me that's why i'm different that's why i can understand this book apart from god i couldn't understand the thing in the first place anyway didn't make a lot of sense but now it does not because i'm great but because of what the holy spirit does whatever way you want to interpret it it's definitely not information about the spirit he's speaking of an authentic encounter with god and that's the heritage of god's children which father in this room wants to just give birth to a child, give him a manual, and then walk out of his life. Here's a book. You want to know anything about me? Here's a book. Just read the book. Don't complain the book. Just read the book. No, no, that father wants to be there. That father wants to make his presence felt. He wants to make his presence felt. And so does our Heavenly Father. He wants to make his presence felt, and he wants us to expect that. That's why Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit in terms of things that he would actually do, not just pieces of information. It was an encounter. Let me close with this. There are two types of people in the kingdom of God. Number one are those who know they have a God of encounter. There, there are those who know. And, and this was what Gideon's fathers were. They were ones who knew they had an encounter with God. So when they talked to this, this next generation about God, they talked about the God of encounter. They talked about a God who did miracles, a God who came into Egypt and set us free, a God who turned water into blood, a God who sent a, a, a plague of frogs, a, a God who, who had a, Moses had a stick and they, uh, they threw it down, it turned into a snake and it ate the, the, the magician's snake, uh, a God who, who when they stood on the edge of a sea, the water parted and they walked through on dry land, a God who when the enemies tried to follow them just held the water back just enough so that the, the Egyptians thought they'd made it and he went, oh, sorry, and squashed it. That's the God that, 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 that Gideon heard about. That's the God that Gideon was spoken about. So because of that, it built a certain expectation in the next generation to believe God to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. What are we leaving with the next generation of people? Are you a person in the first category who knows you have a God of encounter? The second group of people in the kingdom is this, those who have not yet recognized that they have a God of encounter. They don't realize it. Oh, oh, here's the thing. God is a God of encounter for every person. Just some of us don't realize it because we're like my friend going, oh, I'm just looking for something else. I want something. You know, there, there, there's three words that I reckon most Christians should take out of their vocabulary because we use it too much, and it's this. Chance, coincidence, and luck. Chance, coincidence, and luck. Am I saying that things don't happen by chance? No. Am I saying that there aren't such things as coincidences? No. Am I saying that sometimes we don't just get lucky? No. But what I'm saying is they are three of the most overused words in the Christian vocabulary. And every time we use those words, every time we use those words too much, we're taking glory away from God. Because maybe it wasn't chance. Maybe it was God. 
Maybe it wasn't consequence. Maybe it was God. Maybe it wasn't luck. Maybe it was God. A few weeks ago, I shared a story with, with uh, the guys that were here. Anyone remember the story I shared about Dell in the hospital? Remember, I went to hospital and, uh, you know, Dell had just gotten bad news that she was going to be in there for another <coughs> um, four weeks. And so I, I, that morning, I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, I, need you to, I want you to get up and go and visit Dell in hospital. So I did. I got up and I, I, I went to the hospital and I, 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 I shared with, with those of you that were here when I walked in there and Dell explained to me after we sort of started chatting, she said, I looked up and I saw you, Alan, and I felt like it was an angel that walked into the room. And then at the end of our time, we prayed and, and the prayer was very simple. God, the doctors have said another four weeks in rehab. But God... I'm going to pray and we're going to believe that it won't be four weeks and that you could do a miracle. A few hours later, we get a phone call saying the doctors have changed their mind and she's going to be out in a, in a few days or something. Now, when I shared that story a few weeks ago, here's, here's, here's what I want to ask you, those of you that have been coming along. What did you think about that? Gee, that was lucky. That was lucky. Eh? Wasn't that lucky? Doc, doctor must have got it wrong. Oh, you know, Delly's in her 80s. Maybe she's hard of hearing. She didn't hear him right. Maybe she got it wrong. Hey? Huh? See, what a coincidence. What a coincidence. You turned up just as the doctors had walked out given her that bad news. What a coincidence. Hey? Huh? What a coincidence. Or did we sit there and go, wow, what an amazing God. Del did. When I walked in, she used the word angel. She said, I looked up and I literally thought, God had sent an angel. And you know what I think? He did, Del. Just happened to be dressed in my body. But he did. How often does God do things? And we go chance, consequence, luck. And we don't end up giving God the glory that's due his name for the things that he does. Now, here's the thing. When we don't give God the glory, when we're not walking with our eyes open, our ears open, listening for the God of encounter, when we're not living that way, we have nothing to give the next generation other than rules, regulations, theories. That's it. I would love to see us talking more about what has God done for you? What has God done for you? How has he answered your prayer? What's he doing in your life? Where, where, where are the miracles? Where are the encounters? Where are those things that the rest of the world might go, gee, that was lucky, and you go, no, that wasn't luck. Man, if you knew the God I know, you would know that wasn't luck. There's no way that was luck. You see, the God I know was in that hospital room with Dell, and he knew what the doctor was saying, and he knew what was going on in her heart when she got that news, and, 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 and he knew that. And so he sent me to go wasn't just lucky, chance, coincidence. That God loved Del so much that he sent somebody to help to, through whom he could pick her up in that time and that moment of need. And I want to give God all the glory for the things that God has done for me because the more I talk about a God that I encounter and a God who moves and a God who heals and delivers and answers prayer and is a tangible, involved being in my world, that God is attractive. Nobody wants another philosophy, set of rules, do's and don'ts, another way to live or a way to be better. People want spiritual reality and that's what we need to give them. Amen? So Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I want to thank you for your word, God. Lord, it's uh, very different again, service this morning, Father. It just feels a little bit more somber than normal. We didn't get to see Ben throw his drumsticks at us. Uh, Father, we didn't get to... Lift our voices the way that we wanted to, Lord. We didn't get to do all those things where we feel like we are pushing in towards you and giving to you. But God, I pray this morning that as we walk out of here, Father, that we would know that you have given to us. God, you have spoken to us, Lord, through the Psalms. You've spoken to us through the worship, God. You've spoken to us as we took communion this morning. God, you've spoken to us through your word. Father, you've challenged us. You've done things in our lives and in our hearts. And God, as we get up from here and we walk away, give everybody the faith and the courage necessary to call it as it is that God was here today and God said something God did something God planted a thought in my brain father make us people that notice what you're doing people that see what you're doing God and not only that but we take it one step further we are prepared to talk even if the world doesn't want to listen but we are going to open our mouths and we're going to talk of the goodness and the reality of Jesus thank you for the death burial 
and the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you for what you did 2,000 years ago and thank you for the difference it's still making in my life and the lives of the people here. And God, in the next seven days, we pray as we leave this place, God, give everybody in this room in the next seven days an opportunity to tell somebody out there about the goodness of God. Somebody out there this week that is struggling, that feels like life's not worth living, that doesn't realise they have intrinsic value and worth. God, that doesn't realise that they are loved by the creator of the heavens and the earth. God, give us the chance to bump into them this week and to tell them the great message of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Bless you guys.